here's the good news as we encounter all these different people in our lives through our church wherever we may come the great news is this that there is only one who is truly our judge and that is Jesus Jesus is our judge but we're going to encounter people who want to be they want to look at your life and they want to declare whether or not you are right before the Lord okay so the first group of people we have to watch out for are legalists watch out for legalists in verse 16 Paul gives the Colossians a command to adhere to he wrote therefore no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon Sabbath. Well, what's this all about? Evidently, as I mentioned before, there were those in and around Coloss the Colossian Christians who were pressuring them to adhere to the Jewish law. What they were saying to the new believers in Christ is this. Well, it's fine that you believe in Christ, but if you really want to be right with God, you have to add to that the following of the Jewish law. You have to follow the traditions of the Jews along with Christ if you truly want to be right with God. Evidence of that comes in the warning that Paul issued the church in verse 16, 17. Notice the three terms that he used. Three terms there together, Sabbaths, new moons, and festivals or feasts. This was regular Jewish way of speaking about the main festivals of the Jewish religion. Food and drink re refer to the diet, of course. You know that in the Old Testament, God gives them a, a strict sort of diet of what they could eat and what they couldn't eat. And in many cases, someone standing as a faithful Jew was based on following their dietary regulations. But we know in the New Testament, Jesus explained that it's not what enters the body that makes one unclean. That's in Mark 7, 18 through 20, if you want to look it up. Peter had a vision, you remember? Peter had a vision declaring food that was once declared unclean, God declared clean. And he was instructed to eat. And, and he said, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. And, he's, and God said to him, what I've declared clean, do not declare unclean. So the believer in Christ was not required to follow the Jewish ceremonial laws in regard to what they ate or what they drank. But those Judaizers wanted them to follow. They were legalists. They wanted them to follow their rules. Neither is the Christian required to celebrate the festivals or the feast of the Old Testament. When Jesus came, he fulfilled them all. There was no reason for them to carry out these festivals anymore. Well, what about the Sabbath? Preacher, don't we still honor the Sabbath? Don't we still keep the Sabbath? Isn't that what we're doing here today? Keeping the Sabbath? Well, actually, we do not. We celebrate the Lord's Day. In a rare glimpse of the early church, Acts 27, we see the church worshiping. When did they worship? They worshiped on the first day of the week. A day commemorating the resurrection of Jesus. Well, someone, someone may say, well, shouldn't we have a day of rest? After all, God took a day of rest. Shouldn't we follow his example and have a day of rest? Well, physically, absolutely. We, we need a day of rest. That's great. You ought to take a day of rest. Take two days of rest if you want to. But listen, Jesus fulfilled the law. Believers are no longer under the law. Is a day of rest good? Yes. <clears throat> but spiritually speaking, listen to me. We find our rest from our labors and our efforts to satisfy God in Jesus Christ. I think we look at the Sabbath wrong sometimes. You see, in the, in the Old Testament under the law, God did instruct them to take a day of rest. But, but I, spiritually speaking, the day of rest was to show their dependence upon the Lord. They worked six days. They toiled six days to make it happen and to, to gather their things and to, to have food and to cook and all these things. And then God said, on that seventh day, you rest. And that was a demonstration of their faith 
in God and his provisions for them. Now, the Jews came along later and added all sorts of rules on their own, man-made rules that had nothing to do with what God was doing there. But they demonstrated their faith in God by stopping work on that day. They said, God, you're going to provide for us this day. We trust you with that. Now, the believer puts his faith in Christ. And we don't toil or labor after our salvation, but we put all our faith in Christ and we rest in Christ. The false teachers were judging the Colossian Christians based on their adherence to the Jewish law, but Paul wrote, no one is to act as your judge. The term judge means pass unfavorable judgment on, criticize, find fault with. We're not to allow others to intimidate or to question our spirituality. No man can determine what's right and wrong. Only the Lord determines what's right and wrong. And we, we find that by reading his word and, and trusting the Holy Spirit as he guides us. But legalism can still be a problem today. The, Jew, the, Jew, the Jewish leaders were legalists to the max. You follow this rule, this rule, this rule, this rule, and then you're right with God. They didn't care about the heart. They wanted you to follow the rules. And, and the church can, can still be legalistic. The church has established all sorts of rules in its day. You know, when we talk about Baptists, one of the things that people always say about Baptists is, Baptists don't dance. Well, I got news for them. I know a lot of Baptists that dance. But let's think about dancing. What does the Bible say about dancing? Can anybody quote me a verse that, says, that the Bible says, do not dance? Anybody? I'm waiting. Raise your hand. All the way back here. I see you back there. Quote me one. No, you, you can't. There's no regulation in the scripture condemning dancing. In fact, a number of people in the scriptures have danced to the glory of God. Moses' sister Miriam danced to the glory of God. King David danced to the glory of God. Now, David got in trouble for his dancing from his, with his wife, but not from the Lord. The Lord was pleased with his dancing. Now, to be, let me, parents, don't get nervous here. To be sure, there can be some dancing that is not appropriate and can lead to bad things. Listen, young people, when you're out there dancing, don't, I'm, I mean, I know you're going to dance. Don't be gyrating up on somebody. <laughs> you know, keep a little distance in there, you know. I don't know if that's a good word to use in the church, but <laughs> <clears throat> let's just be honest. Okay, <clears throat> so I've seen some folks dancing. They need to put a little space in there, at least some room for the Holy Spirit between them. <laughs> and it can lead to bad things. So let's be careful how we dance and what we do. Let's honor the Lord in all things. There are other denominations that put pro, uh, prohibition on styles of dress and makeup. But none of those rules are found in the New Testament. Certainly, ladies, in 1 Peter, the Scripture calls you to not let your beauty simply be on the outside, the adorning of yourselves with gold or makeup or clothes or all these things, but that your beauty should come from the inside. But it doesn't say that you can't dress in a, in a certain way. But we know that we are to dress modestly. Paul said, I also want women to dress modestly. And he wants, and the scripture indicates that men are to dress modestly with decency. Both men and women should dress in a manner that honors God. Now listen, we don't have any hard, fast rules about how we're to dress. But ladies, listen to me. Men, listen to me. Young people, listen to me. You should dress, the scripture says, in a modest manner. Your body is not for everybody else's uh, view or pleasure of their eyes. First, your body belongs to the Lord. And second, if you're married, your, your body belongs to your spouse. And so we should honor both the Lord and our spouse with how we dress. And we dress 
modestly. But there's no hard, fast rules how to do that. My point is this. <clears throat> Believers, do not allow legalists to make rules for what a good Christian is. Read the Word of God. Listen to the Holy Spirit of God and follow His ways. Follow Christ. Paul said all these practices of the Old Testament were a shadow of Christ. Look at the Scripture again. Things which were a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to to Christ. And so we get caught up in following all these rules. That's like trying to hold the hand or to hug a shadow when the, the reality of the person is there. You're following something that you can't touch, you can't feel, that doesn't do anything, the shadow, when Christ is right here with us. So let's not worry about the shadow. We're thankful for the way he worked in the Old Testament, but now we have Christ who is reality. And substance. Okay? So you can follow a bunch of rules man set up, but it will not, never change your life. It will never change your heart. There's only one way that your life and your heart will be changed, and that's faith in Jesus Christ. And if you'll trust him, if you'll trust the sacrifice that he made on the cross, believing that he died, he rose again, and, and having, as the Holy Spirit convicts you, having the faith to turn from yourself and your sin and to walk after Christ, He'll save you and he'll change you. You'll never be the same. You don't have to follow, follow a bunch of rules. We follow Christ. So watch out for the legalist. Now to be sure, we have rules to follow. The scripture tells us uh, in 1 Peter that we're to respect authority. We have rules in our society that we follow. And we have rules in the church that we follow as we follow Christ. But we don't follow these legalists who want to make additions to what it means to be saved. So watch out for the legalists. They're out there. Maybe in here. Listen, if you're a legalist, and I got to confess to you, I'm a recovering legalist. It's easy for me to be a legalist. It's easy for me to say, this is the rule, and this is what we ought to do. And if you do this, you're right with God. If you don't do that, you're not right with God. It's easy to do. But if you're a legalist, put it away. Stop looking at other people and try to judge their relationship with Christ and judge your relationship, allow the Holy Spirit to judge your relationship with Christ. And you walk after the Lord. All right? Legalists, they're tough. But there's a second group. He also warned of mystics. Mystics. Look at verse 18. Paul wrote, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement abasement and the worship of angels. Taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Paul warned about those who were defrauding uh, the Colossians of their prize. Their prize was Christ and their relationship with Christ. The word translated defraud could be translated disqualify. Paul was telling the Christians that no person was to stand back, look at their life, and pretend to be their umpire determining whether or not they were uh, right with God. In athletic terms, the umpire disqualifies the contestants uh, because he, he's not obeyed the rules. And so they, uh, Paul was saying, you can't stand back there. You can't allow somebody to stand back there and look at your life and determine if you're inbounds or out of bounds. You can't let someone uh, say that, that you're not following the rules or anything like that. What were the mystic rules? Well, he, he mentioned some of this. He said, uh, they, they, they exuded this humility, but it's a false humility. They took pride in their worship of angels. Now, that seems weird to us, but what they would have said back then is, well, we're not good enough to worship God. We're not holy enough to come into God's presence, so we're going to start lower than him. We're going to worship his angels. And then as they worship these angels, there's reports and doc, uh, documentation that they would uh, tout this, this connection with angels. That they would come into the presence of angels and they would make contact with them. And they touted visions and took stands based upon these visions instead of based upon the word of God or faith in Jesus. False, false teachers took great pride in their contact with these angels and visions. Paul said that they were 
inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. There were people who took great pride and authority in their experiences. The worshiper of angels may say, uh, as I said, I'm not good enough to worship God, but I'm going to worship these angels. And, and they, they, they said that they, they uh, saw these angels. They had conversations with these angels. And as they told other people, they said, this is why I'm able to do this because I've, I've talked to angels. And so they would legitimize their practice by saying that they've had contact with angels. They say, well, uh, down through the centuries and even in modern day, people say, well, I had this vision. God spoke to me in this vision. And so the reason I'm able to act this way or the reason this is right is because I had a vision from God and God told me this was right. And so I'm doing this. Maybe contrary to scripture, but they said, I'm standing on this instead of the word of God because God has given me this new revelation in this vision. And so they would tout these visions as an indication they were right with God and the experience of visions legitimized them. Paul says, watch out for these mystics. Well, there are those still today who promote experience over a relationship with Christ and over the word of God. There are those who suggest that you have to have a uh, a certain to you have to experience a certain phenomenon or you cannot be Christians. There's a denomination that tells us unless you have spoken in tongues, you cannot be a Christian. Simply stated, I want you to listen to me very closely. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying right here. This denomination says that you cannot be a Christian unless you have spoken in tongues. Simply stated, that is unbiblical and completely and utterly false. Nowhere in the scriptures will you see salvation tied to speaking in tongues. Salvation is not tied to anything else except the conviction of the Holy Spirit and a man repenting and putting his faith in Christ alone. That is where salvation comes, not from some experience that you have. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12, 30, I don't know how they keep preaching this, 1 Corinthians 12, 30 is really clear that, that not everyone has the gift of tongues. When he wrote, Paul wrote, all do not speak with tongues. Could it be any clearer? But many try to make experience a part of salvation. But the only experience you and I or anyone else needs in salvation is, that's why, like I said, conviction of the Holy Spirit and faith in Christ. But there are still those around us who say you have to have this experience. And they claim all sorts of experiences. Well, listen, let's just get this out of the way. I know some of you are probably saying, well, preacher, what do you think about the gift of tongues? <clears throat> well, here's what I'm going to tell you. It would be hard for me to believe the gift of tongues is still active today. The gift of tongues is something that comes upon someone by way of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that person begins to speak in a different tongue by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when that person speaks in tongues, that is an infallible word from God. Some would say the gift of tongues was active in the New Testament days to legitimize the Christian Christians there. I, I would go with that. And some would say that it has ceased. They would say that all the gifts have ceased today. Now, I can't be dogmatic about that, but I'm just telling you kind of where I am. Now, I do believe in something called ecstatic utterance. That is different from the gift of tongues that someone speaks in some different way of speaking that is an ecstatic utterance but it is not the infallible word of god through the gift of tongues and if somebody wants to do that i'm not sure what the benefit of that is i don't do that i've never i've never done that i've never experienced tongues or any other language i tried to speak a part of spanish one time but it didn't work but if someone i 
I'm not, if someone wants to have an ecstatic utterance or they have an ecstatic utterance, that's not, that's not, I'm not to judge that. That's not my business. Okay? So believers may have some spiritual experience of varying, varying kinds. Experiences themselves are not evil. When we try to make our experience, here's the problem. Listen close. When we try to make our experience the standard for all believers, and when we say, if you have not had this experience, then you can't be right with God. If you have not experienced this, then you can't be a true believer. That's when experiences, we don't need to pay attention to that. That's when the mystics are trying to make you something that you're not. Or they become arrogant or put themselves above you. Here's the thing. Christ is central. Not rules, not experiences. Christ is central. Watch out for legalists. Watch out for mystics. One more. Watch out for ascetics. Paul, Paul's final warning is against asceticism. Asceticism is a, a religious philosophy which teaches that depraving the body or harming ourselves or depriving ourselves of something is, uh, makes us holy or, or gains more approval from God. There have been many down through the years who have sought to find favor with God through denial or deprivation. Some have slept in on hard beds, and they said, if I, can, if I have no comfort, I sleep on this cold, hard stone bed, then, then I'll become holier. It will please God. Some have, have slept out in the, in the snow without shelter and without heat, and they did this in the name of making themselves holier or more pleasing to God. Some have climbed flights and flights of stairs, even on their knees to the point that their knees burst open with blood in order to please God or find themselves pleasing to God. But those things do not bring one into favor with God. To be sure, there are times we, we deprive ourselves of, of, uh, for the purposes of God, but listen, listen to what the scripture says, what, what Paul is describing here. He says, if you died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you're living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Why are you listening to these people who tell you to deprive yourself of the things that God has given you? As I said, there's sometimes we do deprive ourselves. Certainly there have been missionaries down through the ages who have sold everything they have, and even today, sell everything they have as they live in somewhat of luxury, and they move to a foreign country somewhere, and they live in a, a, a mud hut with a grass roof. And they, they have very little, and God calls them to that. We know that believers <clears throat> sometimes deny themselves food or, or something else for the purpose of prayer and fasting. Of course, uh, the Lord encourages his people, and we're called to, to fast and to focus for the purpose of, of focusing on on something uh, for, the, for the Lord, some purpose of the Lord. But not everyone's called to live in the cold. Not everybody's called to live in a cardboard box. We, we see in Scripture that God blessed many with wealth. Job was a wealthy man. Abraham was a wealthy man. David had anything and everything in his disposal, and he was called a man after God's own heart. The problem with ascetics is that not, it's just not a teaching from God. And those around the Colossians were trying to pull them into this man-made religion and calling them to do something that God's not called them to do. Now listen, this is probably not something that you and I deal with. I, I don't think I've had anybody come to the office lately and say, well, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and it feel." And I feel like I need to, um, instead of sleeping in my bed, I need to go out and sleep on this rock in the backyard in the middle of winter and deny myself to eat. We're not very good at denying ourselves. <clears throat> but the point is this, no amount of denial or deprivation will make us holy. Only faith and fellowship in Christ. The truth is that, that most of us, I would do well to deny myself some things. As my clothes get tighter and my pants get tighter, I would do well to deprive myself of some things. And it wouldn't hurt us to deprive ourselves of some of the toys that we buy. It wouldn't hurt us to deprive ourselves of some of the leisure activities that, that we participate in and instead focus more on the Lord. 
We are a country of people, uh, of wealthy people. Even in this place today, if you say, well, I'm not wealthy, the poorest of us in this place is very wealthy, comparatively speaking, to those around the world. And it would not hurt us one bit to learn to deprive ourselves every now and then of the things of God. But never fall into the mistake of thinking because you give some money or because you give your time or because you don't buy this boat and instead you give it to Lottie Moon Christmas offering or something like that, which is coming up. That will not make you more holy in the eyes of God. The only way that you can be holy in the eyes of God is if you're washed in the blood of Christ and you stand. God sees you through the holiness of Christ and the holiness of Christ is cast upon you by his grace. No amount of working, no amount of sacrifice can bring you salvation. Only the blood of Christ. So listen. Watch out for the legalists, those who want to make the rules for you. Certainly the Bible has do's and don'ts. We want to follow those. But you read the Bible and see what the Bible says about do's and don'ts. And you, you trust Christ and you, you follow him. Not all the one legalists around you who want to make these extra rules that you have to follow. Beware the mystics who say, unless you've had this experience, you can't be truly Christ. You can't be the, the child of God unless you've had this experience. Christ is above any experience. Beware the ascetics who will call you to deprive yourself. And if you deprive yourself enough, just maybe God will let you into his kingdom. Beware of them because the Bible says this. Listen close. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If he has the right experience. No. Nope. If he gives away all his money. No. Nope. If he follows this set of rules. He doesn't dance. He wears long sleeves all the time. Uh, long pants all the time. No makeup. Hair in a certain style. Nope. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The promise of Scripture is this. He saves us by His grace, not our works, lest any man should boast. So if you need Christ today, stop striving, stop working, rest in Jesus. Trust Him. Follow Him. Put your faith in Him. He's done all the work for us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your grace. I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that you've provided everything that we need for salvation. And the truth is that we cannot earn your salvation. But it's only by your grace that we are saved. We are utterly wretched. We have nothing to bring before you. But God, in your grace, you stooped to our level. You sent your one and only son, Jesus Christ, to walk on this earth in, without sin, to be the ultimate sacrifice, the once for all sacrifice, perfect sacrifice, unblemished sacrifice for our sin. And Lord, any who will trust in him will be saved. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be men and women who carry that message out. And if we have a tendency to go any other way, may, we, may you strip that from our hearts and strip that uh, from our minds. And for any in this place, Lord, who, any person that does not know you, I pray today would be the day of salvation. And may they call on your name. May they trust you. May they repent of sin. As you save them. As you have your heads bowed, I would ask you the question, and, and only you can answer this question. Are you saved? Have you been converted? I'm not asking you, have you taken certain steps or done certain things? But I'm asking you, have you experienced the grace of God Have you been converted? Have you been pulled from darkness into light? 
If not, I would call on you again to quit striving and simply call on the name of the Lord. Would you just confess your sin to him? Acknowledge that his way is the right way. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I failed to live according to your standard. I failed to think according to your standard. And so now, Lord, I, I give myself to you. I place my faith. I give you my life. I, I'm, I'm determined to walk after you. Will you save me? Will you accept me as your child? And the promise of Scripture is he will. In just a moment, Brother J.D.'s here, Brother Tim's here, Brother Raymond's going to sing a song, and as we sing, that's a time for you to respond to God's Word. Maybe you may look at your life and you say, you know what, I've been a legalist for a long time. I've added all these rules and, and said, unless I follow these rules or unless someone else follows these rules, they can't be right with God. You may want to repent of that this morning and just ask God to give you some freedom there. You may be one who's felt bad because you've not experienced certain, or you've not had certain experiences and you thought your faith was a second-rate faith. You may want to re repent of that. If God wants you to have those experiences, he can certainly make you have those experiences. You may be one who's bought into the lie of depriving yourself, or the truth is you may be one who say, you know what, I really do need to deprive myself of a few things and so I can focus on the Lord. I need to fast sometimes or I need to sacrifice my time. You can repent of whichever one those are. But I'd ask you to respond to the Lord today, maybe to join our church for salvation. We'd love to share more with you about the gospel. Whatever the case may be, would you respond to the Lord? Let's stand very quietly. Brother Raymond, you lead us as we sing. Father, I pray that you'd have your way in this time, and may your Holy Spirit convict our hearts of the truths of Scripture. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. You come as we sing. Jesus, be the center. Be my source, be my light, Jesus. Jesus, be the center, be my hope, be my song. fire in my heart be the wind in these sails be the reason that I live Jesus Jesus Thank you uh, you can be seated for just a moment. Our men are coming forward to get the offering plates. I do want to say a word of thank you to you for the great uh, trunk or treat that you uh, participated in last week. You did a wonderful job. That's what I love to see. I think that's what the Lord loves to see. When we say we're going to do something, we do it to the best of our ability, and I'm thankful for that. Speaking of that, I hope you have a shoebox. Miss Bejo, when do these have to be turned in? Today. Man, so if you have your shoebox at home, you need to get it up here. Uh, it's going to be closed today, Miss Bejo. Tomorrow be good? All right, this week. So get your boxes. Uh, we, <laughs> she, she crawfishes, doesn't she? <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> get your boxes, fill them up. Let's do it right. Let's not have five or six or even 50 boxes. Let's accomplish our goal as the people of God, blessed by God, given the resources to do whatever we want to do. Let's get it done, and let's uh, make a good show. And if we're going to do this ministry, if we're going to participate in it, let's do it right, okay? Any, um, let's see, anything else we need to say before I go? You know, with that in mind, you're talking about going all in. We're going to have our carols by candlelight on December 11th and 12th. How many of y'all remember what that is? Some of you do. We did it about 8 to 10 years ago. 
But anyway, we're not going to do it at the uh, Civic Center this year. We're going to do it up here in the WMU building upstairs in our banquet room. But we're going to host it two nights because it's a little bit smaller of a venue. And, you know, we had 50 trunks for Trunk or Treat. But all I need is 20 hostesses. And that's going to be that. So you can sign up online for that. You'll, all you have to do is decorate your table and invite people to fill it. That's it. We'll take care of the food and the entertainment. It'll be a great night. All right. Next Sunday, don't forget we have our, our annual meal together over in the uh, gym. We'll come to church. We'll go to Sunday school. You'll bring your best desserts. That's the ones you do the best. You cook the best. And vegetables. So you come, we'll provide meat and bread, you come, tea and all that stuff, so you come and be a part of that. I want you to pray for me. I'm uh, preaching tomorrow.